Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world, and welcome to today's first World Skills Conference talk of 2020. This is a series of five talks in total, precipitated, of course, by the current COVID-19 pandemic, but focused particularly on its economic impact, on its effect on young people and adults in learning, and the potential for a skills-led recovery. I hope many of you will have seen our While the World Pauses campaign, which recognizes and celebrates all the essential workers that have kept our world moving during these difficult times. We owe them much, and this series of talks is partly a homage to them. My name is Chris Humphreys. I'm acting president of World Skills International and today's moderator for this talk. At the time of beginning, we had 700 people registered for the event, and I hope you all enjoy the experience. In this talk, we want to give a voice to youth, to hear the very different stories of three of our World Skills champions and how they have been affected and been coping during the past few months. We will also have World Skills stakeholders here to respond directly to those case studies as well as share with us their strategies, both during the pandemic and for the new normal that will follow. In case you're not able to see all of the event, we are recording the webinar for uh, future use and it will be held on the World Skills YouTube channel. Before I introduce the speakers though, let's hear first from the Chief Executive Officer of World Skills, David Hoey. Over to you, David. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Chris. I'd like to start by extending a warm welcome to our attendees. Uh, this is a welcome to members, our partners from industry, education, and other international organizations, former World Skills competitors who we affectionately and respectfully call champions, and other people from around the world who are joining us today. The goal of these World Skills Conference talks is to share expertise, um, to learn from each other, and to provide a networking platform, especially since physical meetings and conferences will still not be possible in the near future. World Skills wants to continue to bring people together and to enhance the exchange between young professionals and all partners and policy makers involved. This is the, the time in which skilled professionals can show all their potential and it becomes visible to the world what they're able to do. Skills development and effective deployment will be critical to the post-pandemic economies. So now it's upon us to support young skilled professionals and help them keep their workplaces, continue their education and training and follow their career paths further. In finishing, I wanna thank everyone who is contributing with their time and resources, not just to create these virtual meetings, but also to keep the World Skills Movement active globally and more broadly, to help each other through a time of crisis. So all the best to everyone. Back to you, Chris. Thanks very much, David. Uh, and let me introduce today's panelists. So representing our skills champions and young skilled professionals in general from all around the world, we have with us today, Amelia Addis, from New Zealand, who I must stress it's after midnight for Amelia now, Shay White from Barbados, and Bart Deutsch from Belgium. They will share with us what they have experienced during the last couple of months and how the pandemic has affected both their careers and their personal lives. I'll tell you a little bit more about their background as I talk with each of them. But World Skills is not only a membership organization. It's a vast network, an alliance of industry partners, uh, training organizations, and other international organizations who support the movement continuously and with passion and provide encouragement, 
support and, must say, sponsorship. Representing these allies and friends today are Elfie Klump, who's Head of Partnership Development and Global Education at Festo Didactic, one of our global industry partners. Bohin Shakroon, Director of UNESCO Division for Policies and Lifelong Learning Systems and one of our conference coalition partners. And Mark Bramer, Professor of Woodwork at Conestoga College in Ontario, Canada, and a member of the World Skills Experts Faculty. And it's my great pleasure to welcome them all here today and to thank them for their participation. Now, what I'd like to do is begin by having a, a conversation with and introducing our first champion, who is Bart Deutsch. Uh, Bart competed in 2013 in restaurant service at World Skills Leipzig. And of course, Bart, you've had a, a successful career over many years now, a great job with a quality employer. But of course, you've been working in an industry, one of those industries most hard hit by the pandemic. So can you tell us a bit about how the COVID-19 crisis has impacted upon you and what's happened with you and your work and how you've managed to respond to the experiences. Right, well, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, yes, indeed, so um, I've been working to the hospitality industry for now several years and when the uh, pandemic hit uh, the world, um, obviously the hospitality uh, sector, uh, especially restaurants, are, um, have been the first one to be affected by closing and uh, incapacity to be able to, um, to do work from home, obviously. So um, we all been sent back home. Um, as I'm not responsible or I'm not in charge of where I work, I couldn't change anything from my job, uh, daily job um, objectives. So I, I thought of how could I use my day uh, better than just by sitting at home. And I've decided to contact a hospital to see if I could be a help um, over there. And the, um, they, they choose to ask me to come to uh, support them in introducing a um, uh, connection through video chats between the patients who are not able to do it themselves and their families. Oh, and um, tell us more. I mean, this is fascinating. <laughs> This is quite a change from restaurant service, but of course, it's still a people-focused activity. It's very much focused on trying to help people get the best from the experience they're having. So how did the skills you developed transfer? And tell us a bit more about what you experienced there. So exactly, um, first of all, when I asked if I could be in, of any help, I didn't know where I was stepping in. I don't know anything about the um, um, hospital industry. But obviously, it is much more social than we could think. So um, therefore, my guest relation skills that I've developed through my career were a big help in, in, in that by managing the, um, the, the, the expectation of the guest, uh, of, I mean, of the patients and the family on, on both sides. Uh, but it was on a whole different level. Um, usually I deal with people who are happy to come and, and they, they want to enjoy their, their time in the restaurant, um, where now I had to deal with uh, sadness, with uh, sickness, uh, sometimes frustration from one part and another because they don't have the right information and I'm not able to, to give them um, when it's medical, uh, medical terms. Um, and sadly, even Sadder than that, you have to deal with uh, uh, death and, and, and mental illness. And, and that was something I was not uh, ready for. So a big step into something uh, unknown for me. But it taught me, I think because I don't think I realized all of it now, but it taught me a lot on, on, on managing people and on, on the relation that we can have together. Okay. Now, I think you were also involved in sort of helping to use, our, the patients to use technology to communicate with the rest of the world because of the policies of, of course, uh, policies of isolation. 
Um, I think you provided a bit of a bridge. How did that work? So exactly. So um, the the COVID nineteen affected, as we all know, especially people um, of an L, um, older age usually, and so a lot of our uh, patients were. Uh, people too weak to be able to use their phone or to n n not in correlation with, with the, the new technology. So they didn't have any phones or anything to, to be able to call their family. Um, so they, they were really in the need of our help. And so what we're doing is, first of all, getting the agreement of our, the patients to be able to show them by video to their family. Then we would call the family, set up a, 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 a meeting, um, and then we set up the call and assisting uh, the actual call. So when I mean assisting, we would hold the, 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 the device close enough to them and make sure that the, the communication was uh, fluid. Because, because it is a disease that affects the, the lungs, sometimes they could not speak loudly enough. So we would have to be there, repeat, and then repeat what the family was saying. So there was a real uh, important connection and an important um, uh, role that we have in, into the, those, uh, those vital connections. It sounds to me like the, um, the, the sort of transferable skills that you would have developed during your course were actually hugely useful to you there. Is that, is that true? Yes. Yes, um, I think we, I'm usually working into an industry that has to be uh, able to, to be flexible and, and, and we have to be able to, to adapt ourselves. So that was something I, I'm, new, I'm used to. But obviously, the, the, be able to bring the skills that I've learned somewhere and, and bring them back somewhere else, it has been a, a massive uh, eyes opening for me, but also massive uh, help on, on my day to day job over there. Um, because not only with, with the, the patients and the family, I have to be able to adapt to the, this new um, environment and, and deal with um, doctors and, and nurses, uh, people that I've never dealt with uh, in such a way. So, the, the be able to transfer those skills is primordial and, and I think it's what um, helped most of the one who, who has been able to do something out of, of the, the pandemic, obviously. And do you think you've gained skills from this experience that you will take back to the hospitality industry, to restaurant service when, the, when we enter back into the new normal? Well, obviously, yes. Um, obviously, Tell us, every... uh, what skills? What have you learned? Well, it's from now, um, it's even more like a better understanding of the skills I had before. As I say, human contact, guest relation, those skills have been uh, into another dimension. So I will be able to deal with my guest, I think, in a, in a better way. Uh, but I will be able to, to see that the extent of that when I go back. Um, and I, I gain into organization, um, some organization skills, um, planning, and, and, and some more administrative skills that I, I was not doing on a daily, daily uh, job uh, on my previous work. But I think most of the skills that I, I, I did learn on, on the hospital will come uh, a little bit later. I will have to go back to work on my daily job to see how much I gain of uh, this experience. Well, thank you, Bart. That's really helpful yeah. and quite an, a fascinating experience. I wish we had time to learn more. Um, but let me turn now to Amelia. Uh, Amelia, you've actually, you of course were uh, trained in floristry and competed in 2015 in Sao Paulo. Um, but you also took a different route to Bart. You went in as an entrepreneur, really, to set up your own business. So the challenges you must have been facing uh, over the last few months are obviously quite different from Bart's. Can you tell us a bit about that and how you started to deal with them and how it's worked for you? Yeah, definitely. Um, my experience is fully from, like you said, the perspective of a business owner and an entrepreneur. And just um, 
because of the personal stage I am in my life, I'm actually co-owner of two businesses, one being a floristry business, um, which specializes in weddings and events. And the other being my partner is a mechanic. So we have like a local garage um, automotive workshop as well. So they're two skilled businesses, very different ends of the um, spectrum and, and what we deal with. And we noticed a huge change um, in both of those businesses. I guess, firstly, with my skill, floristry, um, I specialize in, in wedding design specifically. Um, and because there's no events, basically no weddings overnight, um, that had a big impact on not only the immediate events that were planned, but also the ways that couples were planning for next wedding season. So my potential earnings for the next year, that, that was significantly affected. And then the other business is a day-to-day -day, uh, automotive business, which helps people get, people get around. So it's an essential service. Um, but we decided as a business to really limit what we did during um, the circumstances in New Zealand specifically that we locked down fairly quickly. We decided that if we were to close that business, hopefully for a month and only do very emergency jobs, that we would be able to get back to work sooner. And so far that has worked out in our particular situation in New Zealand that after about six weeks, we were able to return to somewhat normal work. Um, so yeah, quite a big difference um, in, in both of those industries. And I guess managing our own fears and uncertainty around what our businesses would look like after this, but also the um, responsibility to staff and um, our customers. You know, our customers rely on us to keep their vehicles safe. Um, so, yeah, trying to manage all of those things was definitely a challenge. And how did, I mean, you obviously took a, a quite a distinct choice in choosing to become an entrepreneur to set up your own business. But also you went into a, quite a specialised area of floristry. You didn't open a shop and you weren't providing services to the public. You were providing big event and wedding services. Um, have have you had any regrets about the way you structured your business or has it caused you to experiment with other ways of offering floristry services or have you ended up focusing more on your other business in this interim period? A little bit um, has made me reflect on some of the different ways that we do it. It was very much a choice to work on those types of events is just what I personally really enjoy. And obviously during this period, um, haven't been able to do that. But a big part of planning to have that business was that we had some security and defer, um, diversifying and having two businesses. Um, so I think if we didn't have that other business, it would have been a totally different decision of how that business would be structured. But I think the thing that, I sort of reflected on the most during this period is because I guess is what essential is um, because one of those businesses seems very much essential in terms of helping people get A to B with their vehicles and it would be really easy to think oh well flowers that's not essential at all but as we are starting to move out of lockdown in New Zealand, there has been a really big demand for people to plan their weddings, but also to even just have flowers at home. And I think um, really acknowledging that those appreciation of nature and of events together, and also, I guess, of art is um, things that are essential for us, maybe not to survive, but for us to really thrive. So um for me it's having the balance and reflecting back on the education experience you had before uh, you became a world skills champion um did you get enough support was there enough training development opportunities to help an entrepreneur make decisions 
Um, did you get enough focus on starting up your own business on the challenges of this on managing through crises? Um, was, was your training sufficient in its preparation as for entrepreneurial activities as it would have been if you'd gone into a normal uh, job-based career? Hmm. A difficult question, I think. I, I think the nature of skilled um, job training and vocational training sets us up to be really adaptable and great entrepreneurs to begin with. Um, very general, I think, that people in skills want to solve problems, um, whatever that is. And so I think that um, kind of inquisitive nature is a big, good beginning for setting you up um, for business. For me personally, the world skills experience of going through a competition really um, sort of gave me the realization of what skills I actually had and how they would be good as a business owner, much the way that um, I guess Bart was saying, like a crisis made him realize how he could transfer skills. Um, Competition made me realize how I could transfer skills. So um, I think that it's one thing to have the skills, but having the confidence to use those and apply them is equally as important. And um, that maybe is something that we should build better into our education. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. We'll, I think we're going to return to that, uh, that whole topic of the education system and its responses uh, in the questions and discussion later. But let me at this point now turn to Shay. Uh, Shay, you are our most recent competitor, I won't say young, but most recent competitor, because uh, you participated in cooking, of course, uh, in 2019 at World Skills Kazan. So essentially, you're just at the end of your learning period, your education phase, uh, and about to start out on your career phase when a bit of a shock hit you uh, and hit your life. And it would be helpful to understand how you as a sort of young um, person who's just completed their training, who's really reached quite a pinnacle in their achievement in their skills, has managed to cope during this period. So tell us what you've gone through and how you've dealt with this as best you can. Well, yes, this time around in the trust, I am the baby of the group. So <laughs> being the youngest, it was a bit different. Um, actually, prior to World Skills Kazan 2019, I was already working. I started working at Epitel in 2018. So like Bart, I'm also in hospitality. So we were very hard hit. So it was just coming to terms with the fact that we would no longer be working and just waiting it out and going with the flow and see what would happen. So that was mainly just it for me. And as an asthmatic, I was actually advised to leave work earlier because I am a high risk person. So pretty much from since March, I've been out from work and I've just been at home and I was out from school as well. And how, what has it meant to you to sort of suddenly lose that access to continuing education and the rounding out of your experience and this entry into work? Um, it, it, it must have been emotionally a bit distressing, but how else has it impacted on? I mean, it was definitely a challenge because in hospitality, it's a very demanding job. It's all in or none at all. And then with school, it was being a practical course. There's not really much that you can do in terms of practical examinations online. So my biggest challenge right now is familiarizing myself with online learning and trying to get back into the motions of being essentially normal from going from a complete standstill to just getting back into the groove. And we now commenced online learner it's been a bit difficult to it's a lot of discipline i think to do online learning especially from home because this is a space that you are most comfortable in so to put yourself in the frame of mind of being productive and being efficient and doing schoolwork it's been a bit of a balance out for me it's actually quite been very difficult but i'm getting accustomed and i'm pushing through I mean, I recognize this. I've, I've always struggled with working at home. For me, the office was a place I could focus. Um, but you've started online learning now. So what are you, what are you covering at the moment? Uh, and what are its strengths as well as the challenges it's giving you? Um, well, right now we're just trying to push through as much of the theory that we've missed out on in the last three months as possible. So just trying to get back up to track. Um, online learning, I think it has its pros and it has its cons. There's not every 
course, every subject that can be done online, like mine, for example, we can only do so much with online learning. And then there's also the case where everybody learns in different ways. So they're not, they're going to be people who will not be able to grasp certain concepts through a screen. Some people need that hands-on approach, that one-on-one -on -one with the teacher going through something step by step with them. So it's definitely been a learning experience. And for someone like me, I tend to grasp concepts very quickly. But just because that's my experience doesn't mean it's everybody else's. So it's just trying to find that middle ground that you can assist everybody in the best way as much as possible. Did you think of changing career during this period? Honestly, I had never fathomed being anything but a chef. From the time I was eight years old, I told my parents, this is it for me. This is what I want to be. And obviously at that age, they were really certain I was going to change my mind. But 12 years later, I'm still here. and This is all I've ever wanted to do. So the thought of having to possibly pursue another career is extremely daunting because my entire school life was targeted towards being a chef, doing culinary-based courses, doing food and nutrition, home economics. So I, I can't say that that's something I'd be looking forward to doing at all. Well, I think for the best people, skills are also passions, and it sounds like it's a passion for you as well. Um, just lastly for you at this stage, what strategies did you, have you developed to sort of manage your time and to try and create a disciplined place for learning in your life and to stay optimistic? Because it's, this has clearly been very challenging for you. Well, actually, the way I've been coping is actually trying to utilize more online learning skills. So in this time where everybody's basically at home, there are a lot of institutions that are offering free online courses. So I've just been trying to get back into the, with helping with my education, get back into that and trying to learn as much as possible about my given field so that when we are getting accustomed to the new normal, I'm not completely blindsided and would have had some customization period to do everything the right way. Well, can I ask a question now to all three of our champions? Um, we've got a group of experts from industry, from education, and from international education policy and practice here in the talk. Um, is there any questions you'd like to specifically address to them before I pass to them? I think we've got, we can't make it easy for them. We need a challenge. So any of you, just put your hand up and we'll and, and speak. I think we can see when each other are muted. Yep, Bart. Well, um, the question will be, during this pandemic, we, we've seen that the uh, flexibility and the adaptability is uh, something primordial. And um, from my experience, it's usually the young people who adapt themselves the best. And, and for the example that I have, I always come up with some ideas that we could De uh, develop in, in, in uh, our business and our um, restaurants and everything. And unfortunately, sometimes due to my young age, I'm not, I'm not being listened enough or I'm not being listened at all. Or they're like, yeah, that's a good idea. And then they just don't implement it. Um, there might be some reason, but I, I'd like to, to know from them uh, why uh, we don't go to the youth, uh, to the younger person more often. Why is it always uh, um, the higher uh, directors and everything who take all the decisions? I understand there is a uh, experience part of it, but I think it could be interesting to to see the youth point of view as they are the following up coming to to those uh, positions and everything they have the understanding of the world. Uh, so so why don't we come more to to them? How do we listen more to the world of youth? A uh, very good question for all of our uh, our experts. Amelia or Shay, anything from you? Amelia? Yeah, I guess I have a little bit of a question is, um, like if we're really wanting to create opportunities for young people to grow confidence in their skills and to develop um, those transferable skills and a real entrepreneurial mindset, um, I think we really need to look at our like current systems and kind of question um, do they allow space for all youth to have equal access to those opportunities like regardless of um, race, gender, sexual orientation or socioeconomic background and, and do we think that um, those opportunities at the moment are equally accessible and if not 
like how can we create checks and balances so that everybody is getting those opportunities to develop um, their, their confidence and those skills that we know are so important to their lifelong learning. Okay, thank you. And Shay? Not really anything else to add. I completely agree with Amelia and Bart, but not so much a question, but just like Bart said, to be inclusive. I find so many times discussions are had about a certain group, about a certain demographic, and that the discussion is never had with the group that it's going to affect. So just include the people that you're making these policies, making these rules for as much as possible. Not to say that it's feasible that everything passed will be in that group's favor, but at least they were given the platform to say what needed to be said, to air their concerns, to state their grievances, and just be included in the discussion. Brilliant, thank you very much. Well, let me now turn to our experts. We've introduced them earlier already, um, but we've had some two interesting questions there. One about how do employers make sure they hear the voice of youth and recognize that the voice of youth may bring a different perspective that is equally valuable to those of the more senior staff. The second question around equity of opportunity and equity of outcome. And a third question for me, really, just to sort of understand as I talk to each of the three experts, what over the last couple of months your organization has been able to do to try and sort of help young people who are confronted with job loss and deferred career paths, et cetera, to cope. So, uh, Boreen, can I turn to you first? Is that we all right? You've uh, had a long history uh, with UNESCO and have undertaken some amazing projects at the international level. And I'm presuming from all of this that there must be some incredible lessons to learn. But what's your personal and immediate reaction to the stories of our champions? Well, thank you very much, Chris, and uh, good afternoon, good morning to uh, all colleagues. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be with you today. And uh, I would like, first of all, to appreciate how much World Skills uh, team is, is playing an important role in, in advancing the global agenda on, on skills for work and life. I think uh, the, the, way, the way we are working with World Skills is really exemplary. And I would like uh, immediately to say that we are supportive for World Skills, we are supportive for uh, World Skills champions, and we would like more. World Skills Champions in the debates, in the international conferences. I had the pleasure to have Amelia with us in the UN building with the, with the Deputy Secretary General and, and Amelia was uh, the, the young persons who are presenting what is important for youth. So I, I think uh, what we are having today, and I'm, I'm really inspired by what uh, Bart, by what Amelia and Shay were, were saying, but um, let me uh, a bit elaborate on, on the discussion in, in, uh, uh, in a very uh, brief way, but uh, I think it's important. I think what uh, both um, uh, you put and uh, what uh, Bart and Amelia uh, and Shape uh, spoke about shows the, uh, the, priv the previous situation and the new normal, if I can say so. What was normal and the new normal? Let me, let me put it in this way. Uh, Bart, Amelia, and Shay were speaking about their experience. And, and Bart, for example, was speaking about uh, how uh, his agency, how he, he engaged in, in, uh, in uh, an initiative uh, back home, and also what he has learned. The uh, transversal skills, engaging from learning, and you were, Chris, pushing him to be a reflective practitioner. I think that's part of the acquisition that he has had. So that, that set of skills is critical. Is that new? No. What is new is that, are we able to better recognize and validate what Bart has learned so that uh, it can help him in engaging in new learning and, and in, in valorizing this for the labor market? I think what's new is coming, for example, uh, the, uh, the use of badges, the use of digital credentials, uh, way of, uh, engaging in different sets of learning and different learning um, uh, settings. Uh, for example, in the workplace, uh, Shay was referring to online learning. Uh, Amelia is about the entrepreneurship. So I think it's important that this, what we are calling a new normal is something that can support in uh, better recognizing the skills that are required, the transferability of those skills, and potentially offering new learning opportunities. Now. This is, I think, uh, important for our discussion and going forward because we need to learn from the crisis 
we need to build further resilience. But I think the task for us is also to reimagine a new skills development in a new direction. And maybe in that, obviously, uh, the, uh, the, the link with the labor market is critical. And what we heard from uh, the, uh, the young speakers is that the economy is, is impacted differently. Different sectors are being impacted differently. Some sectors have suffered. They shut down. Others, they are growing. And globally, we are in a recession. So it's important that uh, the labor market, our capacity to anticipate on the labor market, the understanding of the labor market uh, has to be reinforced. And again, the normal is what we should do is the survey of a company getting this data. That takes time. And Bart was saying how we need to be agile. So I think the new tools and the new normal is about using other tools like the data analytics, like uh, using the opinion of uh, companies on uh, online, other, the other tools that are important. The last piece which I would like to highlight is that, uh, and I, Amelia was referring to that, if any future, if any new normal, what should be and what is continuity is the, the quest for equity and inclusion and leaving no one behind. This is uh, the agenda that we should have all. And this is what, uh, and I respond now to your question. We have launched the Global Education Coalition where we have the pleasure to have a, a World Skills part of it. And uh, it's about leaving no one behind. It's about helping uh, young people acquiring the skills, but also workers developing new skills and, and potentially up, uh, upgrade their skills. And we are working with the Festo, we are working with Microsoft, we are working with the Khan Academy and others to um, support 1 million learners in acquiring skills that are needed in the labor market, particularly that we are now in a challenge of uh, a recession. So that's what we have been trying to do. And I think part of the exercise we are doing is how to involve young people. I have to be um, uh, reflective and I stop there, Chris. Um, it's critical to have youth co-creating. And this is an effort that uh, we have been trying to do, but there are challenges there. And the challenges is how to channel the voice of youth and what mechanism can be in place. Today, when we speak about governance of TVET or skills development, we speak about employers and workers. We don't speak about youth representatives. So one thing that we need to do is to think about how we are reimagining the governance of TVET so that there is a space for youth. Second, youth are not a uniform group. Usually when we speak about youth, we will find uh, youth who are not necessarily representative of the different uh, groups. I think that's effort of making representative voice is important. And the last maybe piece is that uh, as you are doing today, uh, international organization uh, employers will have to uh, open space for youth. And that's not happening all the time. And it's, uh, it's part of the critic that we need to, to give to ourselves. We organized the webinar and then we had somebody from uh, World Skills in the keynote together with me. And I think that's the message that we would like to pass is that youth are not uh, at the end of the uh, plenary or of, of the panel, they're upfront. And that's what you have done today. Thank you so much. Um, thanks very much, Boheen. I mean, I completely agree with you about the voice of youth. I spent the last nine years as, as chair of a vocational university in London which needed to improve itself. And it was delivered by a deep, deep partnership with the students and the student union, hundreds of them working closely with the university administration to change the place so it became a place students want to be and their voice shaped the organization. I completely agree with you. Can I explore something else with you? I mean, Shay raised issues around uh, the access to learning that she had. And VET, I think, poses, faces a particular issue um, it's much easier to imagine how to create an online learning environment for theoretical learning, for university learning. Much more challenging to do it in practical learning areas. Have you got any advice or have you got any learning that UNESCO has found over the last few years that could be good advice to give to education organisations to make a better proposition for VET students? I'm going to ask Mark the same question, but you must see that from around the world. 
Yeah, thank you, Chris. Uh, three uh, points I think uh, are important here to highlight. First of all, uh, according to our data and, and data coming from other UN organization, um, when we had uh, around 1.5 billion learners out of the schools and out of uh, education institution, half of them were not connected to internet and didn't have ICT device. So uh, I think it's important that we, uh, we look at the data and we understand that uh, the opportunity for online learning is not for everybody. And that one of the challenge for all of us is how to ensure going forward that the connectivity is addressed, both in terms of internet connection, but also in terms of um, equipment and in terms of digital skills, which I think Shay referred to it, because connectivity is not only about the hardware, it's also about the capacity to engage in, 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 in digital learning and, and skills development. Second aspect, uh, what we have learned from uh, surveys that we have conducted, and we just finished the survey with the colleagues at the ILO, the World Bank, uh, the Asian Development Bank, and the European Commission, is that in most countries, the strategies have been a mix of strategies. High tech, meaning uh, online learning synchronous. Low tech, meaning uh, it could be online and offline, asynchronous learning, but also no tech. And that means radio, TV, textbooks, uh, other modes of, of engagement that uh, were used by, by countries and by, um, uh, or say, stakeholders. So it's important this mix of strategies and not focusing on only one strategy. Maybe the last point, uh, not to be very long, is that um, we need to think about uh, the resilience building. And it's very important that what we have learned from the last two months, we don't close the, the, the door and, and we move uh, again to uh, the normal. I think part of the discussion that we should have and international engagement is how we will build resilience for new shocks, new uh, challenges, and potentially, as I said earlier, reimagining. And uh, we, the news from Beijing yesterday, uh, if uh, everybody is looking at, shows that we are not out of the crisis and we need to be uh, also conscious about that. So this is what we have learned. The survey shows that, uh, the, uh, particularly we have conducted the company survey, and it shows that uh, the most hit in this context are apprentices, because uh, most of the companies stopped their operation and apprentices are uh, the ones that ha have been uh, most affected, both in terms of uh, learning opportunities, but also in terms of uh, uh, stipend or in terms of wages, because many of the companies stop it giving these. Uh, so it's important that uh, companies, government support apprentices, support learners in this context, because we know that this will affect also the career going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Boheen, and that's a perfect opportunity to, to turn to Mark. Uh, Mark, you're uh, very much in one of those educational organizations who is seeking to support students uh, through these times. Uh, and of course, it isn't just, as Boheen said, about supporting them for now. It's actually about looking at how we transform our systems so that we become more resilient to support them in all sorts of environments and challenges in the future. So can you tell us a bit about um, you know, how it is uh, that you've um, been dealing with this and, and your perspective on how we take this forward and what your response to our young people is too. For sure, Chris, thank you very much and greetings from Canada. I've, uh, I wear two hats this morning. One is uh, World Skills Experts faculty and uh, that is past experts from World Skills and uh, our group is working hard on um, doing some mentoring as well as uh, online developing and uh, some of those other, other uh, partnerings that uh, we are currently doing. My other hat is as a uh, teacher, as a professor of woodworking in, uh, in Canada here. And um, it's been an interesting discussion this morning because that's exactly what's been happening in Canada. You, you champions have, uh, have hit a lot of things on the head. This whole transferable skills, I've often preached that this, this is what we're teaching. Now I'm a cabinet maker by trade and that's the skill I teach. However, I've often 
told my students that what they are receiving is transferable skills. And when they graduate and move on in the career, nowadays, few of us see a career for a lifetime. Many of us are going to change our career in a significant change, maybe two or three times throughout our life. And, um, and so our skills are transferable. The other thing we're doing in education is we've often talked of sort of technical skills and soft skills. You might use different terms in your country, but um, this uh, COVID-19 has really highlighted, I believe, the softer skills, the communication skills, the inclusion skills, all of those kinds of things. And I teach, I teach in a large shop and um, there's, there's a mentality sometimes that we don't need that stuff. Just give us how to be good cabinet makers. And what we're finding now is those uh, skills are becoming more and more important. And so I still think in education, in moving forward, we're gonna need the blend of the technical skills as well as what we call the soft skills, uh, the communication, uh, those kinds of uh, things as well. My students were initially uh, quite stressed, fearful, I could say, of the future because none of us knew. Usually when somebody's fearful of, of something, they go to an expert <laughs> and they get some help. Uh, the problem is we faculty, administration, the rest of us, <laughs> we're, we're not experts in this. And so, and so there was a fear of the future. Um, you know, will my trade still be there? Uh, I appreciated that comment about the apprentices because uh, so many apprentices are, I'm gonna say somewhat fragile initially in, in the beginning of their career and this is not doing them any good. So we need to rally around them or we're going to miss a generation of the younger people moving into our skills. So fear was there initially. I, I think we're past that in Canada, meaning we've got a plan and we're starting to move out of the COVID um, so that students now see, okay, I can return to classes on such and such a day. And I, you know, I uh, can do my online until then and that kind of thing. The other thing that I'm finding with my particular skill trade, um, and you may be able to apply to yours, is that we're human and we have senses. The sense of touch and smell and taste. How do you do that online? <laughs> and, and that's a big part of my crafting trade, uh, can, can I say it that way, is uh, are, are the senses. And so we in education that are developing these online uh, programs have to be very sensitive as uh, I think it was Amelia said or somebody said, it's not for everybody. I think Shay said it's not for everybody. It's not conducive to, to everyone. And so we need to pay attention to the development of that. We're gonna, get, we're gonna develop and we're gonna put resources and energy into it. And it's going to take care of a niche in the market, but we have to be aware and be inclusive of those that really don't learn that way um, and need the other senses involved in that. Um, and I'm just saying the speed of life, the speed of life was a little bit crazy <laughs> in my world prior to COVID-19. And I think that has slowed down a little bit, um, allowed people to come up and breathe a little, look around, um, analyze. And um, we've got our work cut out for us in the skilled trades to, to re-include uh, those young people and things like that, because they've had a chance to step back and to... Uh, and to examine some things and, and look at some things. So we'll need to, again, do our promotion in a good way and, uh, and uh, speak positive of the future because I believe it will be positive. Okay, thanks, Mark. I want to explore, funnily enough, I've just had a question in directed to you uh, from one of our audience. So I'm going to come to audience questions in a minute, but since this one is directed to you, um, one of our listeners said, do you mean to say employability skills will hold as important a role as the hands-on or vocational skills? I'm not an expert in that. I am an educator. I do employability skills and I do hands-on skills um, in, in my programming. Um, 
I, I believe it had an importance beforehand. It just maybe wasn't revealed. Um, and this to me has revealed, you know, the importance of those employability skills for sure. So um, if, if they were downplayed or pushed aside, I think that has been brought into the light and yeah, they'll be very important in the future. Last question for you, if I may. Um, so you, you used the phrase Canada's moving out of this. We know New Zealand is moving out even faster. But are you going to return? Is your college going to return to old normal? Or how are you going to change your programs? Are there lessons you've learned from this that will produce permanent change? I mean, you seem to be talking about the value of a blended learning environment where people could do some learning at home, but they need that practical experience in the workshop, they may be other things. How do you think your college will change its provision in the future that will become a more permanent feature as a result of COVID-19? Well, some of the changes that we have made immediately is we're returning to, um, th there'll be more online information. There's no question about that. We faculty have put our information online so it will be more accessible to people. Um, second of all, something like my trade, cabinet making, where there's a, an in-the-shop component of construction and building, um, we, have, uh, we will be returning to, to a, a facility in the near future. And um, the strategy is smaller group sizes with some of that social distancing involved in that. So students will, uh, will be working on their benches and will be obviously sharing some machines and equipment and that kind of thing. It is quite doable. Um, the shop sizes have been reduced, um, which I believe will increase a, a more one-on-one -on -one type learning um, rather than continuing larger, larger group sizes. Um, so, so, so that's something that we've done immediately. That will it hold for the future? I, I believe it will. Most of us, uh, we're social beings. And the first thing we want to do when we see a buddy who we haven't seen for a long time is give him or her a handshake or, or them a, a hug or something like that. And that has been taken away from us at the current time. So it will be interesting just to see what that whole social uh, distancing does to, to that area of our lives. But, um, but as far as uh, returning to, to normal, no, it will not go back to the way it was, I don't believe. Uh, nevertheless, um, we'll, uh, we'll return with a, a, wiser, a wiser understanding of, uh, of each other, I believe. Thank you very much, Mark. So let me, let me turn now to Elfie uh, Klump from Festo. Festo, of course, one of our major employers uh, in the world of international manufacturing and tools for, for this sort of work, um, but equally an employer and an employer who is the destination for many young people uh, who are undergoing training and education now. So um, can I look to you now, Elfie, and sort of explore a couple of things? I mean, firstly, you're a, an industry right at the heart of, of much of the world's manufacturing provision. Uh, you are a service organization to many others as well as to craftspeople. Um, so can you tell us, how has this been affecting your core manufacturing and business activities. Give us a picture of the impact on business first and before I turn to the issue of training and development for your people. Yes, thank you, Chris, uh, with great pleasure and uh, good morning, good afternoon to everybody of you. Yes, um, Festo, of course, like many other companies around the globe, also has been uh, affected uh, by the coronavirus. And uh, since the beginning of the year, we are uh, paralyzed somehow and uh, we have to adapt to this quickly and uh, adapt to this uh, change every day. So looking at the manufacturing point of view, uh, maybe two uh, concrete measures which have been taken, uh, which have been undertaken. The first one is of course, uh, health and safety for all of our colleagues, uh, for all of our uh, partners, for all of our suppliers and for our customers is at first 
uh, throughout all operations uh, in the world of, uh, of Festo. And for this, um, a COVID-19 task force has been set up very early with uh, three, three major goals, keep the operations running, keep the supplies to the customers going and uh, keep the infection rate uh, at a minimum. And besides that, of course, a lot of uh, contingency uh, plans uh, with our partners and suppliers have been uh, put up to cope with the daily uh, troubleshooting or unforeseen uh, coming up uh, in, in this context. And uh, from a, uh, let's say, from an operational point of view, administrative point of view, we are in home office. Uh, most of the people uh, within the festival world, as far as is possible, uh, are working uh, from home at the moment. Uh, we had to invest heavily uh, in, in IT infrastructure and our IT team luckily did a really great job here. And uh, like everybody also here, we Zoom, we go to meeting, we Skype, we do uh, most of the work uh, uh, from the home office. And um, yeah, so we ask uh, ourselves, of course, uh, every day, uh, what has COVID brought to us? What stays? Uh, what do we have to look for? What do we have to change uh, to go into this uh, so-called new normal or the, the, the afterworld, so to speak? Chris, I cannot hear you at the moment. Apologies, I needed to unmute. Um, Elfie, the, the, the second part of this is that Festo is a company that is hugely supportive of training. You invest in support for schools and colleges around the world. You are active uh, as, a, as a fantastic partner in world skills. And of course, you have your own training and development offering for your own team. So how has this affected you, that aspect of your company's activity? And how are you responding to it? How are you coping with that change? And what are you support are you giving? to your learners? Maybe I can take this question uh, in two parts. One is uh, how do we uh, address the education market or what do, you would, what do we feel from the education market? Well, first of all, I think we can say that uh, the education market is in full disruption mode. I mean, uh, millions of learners are at home and millions of schools are shut down. Um, uh, Bohen mentioned and tapped on the question of uh, connectivity, on the question of accessibility. And uh, so we can say, of course, uh, the virus is digitalizing also uh, our market. It's uh, going to uh, digitalize uh, the technical, the TBET sector, the work uh, workplace learning sector. Um, looking here at world skills because this is uh, the TBET sector. Um, the question is only to which extent, uh, to which level is going uh, to be uh, affected and uh, how can we uh, organize, uh, let's say, TVET to some extent in a, in a digital way. So in a nutshell, this uh, virus is a game changer. And of course, we had also to react uh, from Festo, um, uh, like uh, many other companies around the globe uh, in the uh, education sector because um, a lot of uh, um, training and education is done uh, uh, online. Uh, online courses are on the rise. Uh, digitalization of education is on the rise. Uh, we had uh, to, uh, to, to come up with solutions um, for uh, physical trainings, which we normally offer around the globe uh, in, to, to, to industry customers. We have, for example, 45,000 uh, industry customers going physically to seminars every year. So obviously uh, we had uh, to come up with a lot of uh, new curated uh, platforms and uh, do this online. We see a hybrid model uh, coming up for the future. Uh, to some extent uh, in physical uh, classroom, but uh, obviously also a, a good portion, if feasible, um, uh, remotely. So um, in a nutshell, uh, education in the digital format is booming. Uh, I think uh, everybody can uh, feel that. Um, um, I can feel it also with my daughter, for example. She is now completely at home from... Uh, um, from university. 
And uh, obviously, what did we do uh, from Festo? How do we? Because education is in our responsibility. We are we, uh, education is in our DNA of the company. Uh, we are a learning company, so uh, obviously, um, it is our responsibility also to bring our share here to the to the table and uh, come up with solutions. And this is why we are very uh, happy to uh, support initiatives of uh, recovery. Uh, we are happy to support here also the um, uh, UNESCO Global Education. Uh, education. And uh, here concretely, for example, we offer online training models in the water sector because everybody knows that the water sector has become even more uh, crucial uh, during those uh, days. And um, as we as a whole company are in the field of supplying parts to um, um, so-called system relevant sectors like the health and uh, the health sector, the pharmaceutical sector or the food uh, uh, production sector, Obviously, uh, we um, do our best and our utmost to keep our operations uh, running globally. And maybe one uh, last point. Um, you, um, I'm, I have to say I'm very impressed here um, about the, uh, our champions, uh, what they uh, elaborated and uh, how they shifted their skills to a completely different environment. And, um, Yes, of course, use is in the focus. If it's uh, use is the future, so uh, obviously this is uh, this is our responsibility uh, first and foremost. Uh, and um, here we at Festo, we uh, we have about 350 trainees and apprentices throughout our global operations. And of course, uh, we have to come up with new learning formats to keep. Uh, our uh, apprentices in the in, in the learning mode. That means uh, we try to to offer also courses, uh, teaching formats, so that they can make full use of the time and uh, that we can uh, keep it going. Brilliant. Uh, thanks very much, Elfie. Uh, I wanted to finish with with you with a question that I'm also going to offer to Mark, um, because we've had some good questions coming in from our audience. Uh, and one of them relates very much, I think, to both your field of, of activity and also to Mark's, uh, which is the question of, does virtual simulation have a role to play here? Or are there just too many things that are difficult at this point in time, at least, uh, to use that might provide that sort of replacement for practical classroom? Well, well workshop learning is really what it's about. Do you think there's a role for, for simulation here? Um, yeah, uh, my, my answer would be yes, and it's going to be a mixture. It's going to be a hybrid model. Of course, you cannot uh, transfer everything to simulation. That's, uh, that's for sure. We know that. And uh, as we always say at uh, World Skills, skills is with uh, heart, um, head, and hand. So, and uh, obviously you can do a lot of simulation and I'm sure we will see things coming up which we are not uh, even have thought of uh, today and maybe in the, in the next five years and a lot of things will be going digital and move to digital uh, learning to uh, remote learning. But obviously, obviously at the end of the day, if you want to make, make a cabinet, uh, you, you have to use your hands and uh, Need to also maybe to smell the wood or, or whatever, and uh, like Mark said, uh, uh, you, you you have also to 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 this factor in in the whole in the whole uh, uh, in in the whole environment. Or if I look at Bath with uh, hospitality and with the uh, with where, where his stills are, I mean this cannot be moved bit digital. Uh, that, that's for sure. So, but uh, in a nutshell, I, I'm, I'm convinced personally also that this virus is tremendously digitalizing uh, the education market. That's for, that's for sure. Yeah, and um, we have seen that at Festo uh, in the in the past few months already. Um, and uh, we are, by the way, we are very confident and we are very uh, optimistic that this is going to offer us uh, uh, tremendous chances um, uh, to bring not only our portfolio to the education market, but for the whole, uh, for the whole education sector. 
And uh, one last point to finish is uh, last uh, this week I um, uh, listened to a radio emission with, which said uh, we are uh, we should not lose a generation of education. Yeah, and so this worried me very much uh, because uh, if I look at the accessibility and the connectivity, and then uh, people hearing uh, people saying we should not lose uh, a generation of education. Um, this brings me back to the uh, to the remark of Bart, uh, who said, who, "Where is the use?" And of course, here we have to bring in the use and put it right in the middle, because this is our next generation. Thank you very much, and I'm going to come back to our champions in a in a few minutes to actually pick up that whole issue of how we can do that. But let me turn, as I said, I would to Mark, because Mark, your uh, in fact, the question specifically said. Um, how can we use virtual simulation in cabinet making? So um, what's the role that technology can play here? There, there's also one other point I'm going to come to, uh, Borheen, with you, which is the whole issue, which has also been raising questions about access to the internet and access to ICT. But uh, Mark, I mean, virtual simulation, cabinet making, and where can we gain from technology? Yeah, well, I, I believe what, but Alfie said was true. We're going to end up with a hybrid in our education of both online and some type of practical um, outworking. I hope cooking never goes to complete virtual or we're gonna be a bunch of hungry people. So, but in, in a practical way, if you can imagine cabinet making, ironically, World Skills has been doing this for a long time where we give the competitors a package of wood, a package of parts, and from that, they've got to construct it. And so you can imagine myself as an instructor with 20 students in my class, I could watch them virtually on a Zoom do the joints in front of my eyes. And what that, what that actually does is it, it gives me a, a quick comparison. Who's moving? too fast, who's moving too slow, who's being careless, who's all on one screen, I could actually see them construct before my eyes in real time and end up with a project at the end. Um, the only problem is in evaluating it. I can't physically try the door or the drawer to see if it's sticking or, or working or to that extent. So there are some limitations, but um, being creative and, and looking at something like that or a portion of, of my education being done in that way would be, would be interesting. The students then still get to touch, smell, taste, do their senses with what's in front of them. It is, um, and in Canada, we're, we're fortunate to have the, the, you know, the internet and the conduct Activity, you know, fairly, fairly strong in, in most regions. So, so something like that could be done. Um, so, so it's interesting. It's still experimental, uh, but I, I, I believe there's elements that could be done to it. Yeah, so very early days, even for those nations with connectivity. But Boheen, a big challenge, isn't it? This whole issue of access to digital learning where that's either needed or effective uh, is a real problem for much of the world. Well, yes, indeed. Uh, just to just to build on on what Mark uh, just said, and, and uh, I will come to uh, the point. Um, I think that we we see the potential of the technology in terms of uh, virtual reality, in terms of online learning, in terms of augmented reality. Because I think uh, some of the pedagogical challenge that we had in the past could be uh, now uh, better uh, in a way uh, presented and, and the teaching and learning can benefit from, from that. I worked myself in the cable industry and I was training uh, workers on how the, the cable uh, can be pr pr produced. And it was very challenging to present the, the phenomenon that happens in, in the cable when it gets it get, uh, produced. So I think the technology can help us to leverage uh, a lot of uh, uh, tools and resources that we, we didn't think be before, but it comes with the challenges. And 
One of the challenges before I come to the equity and inclusion is, of course, about uh, learners' uh, data protection, privacy, security. This is something that uh, is critical and is coming as one of the major challenges we see as well in this uh, phenomenon of migration to online and platform learning, uh, unfortunately. So I think it's important that we, we keep this in mind. And it's part of the ethical uh, behavior and the ethical engagement that uh, the ad tech industry has to take into consideration the industry broadly, the training providers, and the international community. But the ethic is also about uh, inclusion and equity, I believe. And uh, I, I presented earlier the data, but uh, the data shouldn't, uh, shouldn't prevent us from action. In reality, they should drive our action. And I, I, I need to say that there are many initiatives that are trying to address this challenge including through the Global Education Coalition, to give you three examples. One, uh, we worked with uh, uh, different companies to bring in uh, uh, what we, we call connectivity to most marginalized learners and communities. And uh, part of it is about uh, equipment. And, and many uh, organizations are offering uh, devices, tablet, et cetera, and without naming brands, but there is, there is this effort of uh, solidarity that is uh, opening for the most marginalized. Second, uh, there is a lot of uh, discussion on how to have a quick wins related to connectivity. Just to mention a few examples, we, we work with some organization on uh, hotspots and, and, and how to ensure that in communities where there is no internet, there could be some form of connectivity in, in, in local uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, there is also all the, uh, uh, I would say, inclusiveness by design, having uh, apps and, and resources and, and platform that can work online and offline, uh, that can work also in, in a low, uh, call it in light mode for uh, the uh, internet uh, connection. So there is this effort as well. And then there is innovation and creativity that is interesting. If you take, uh, and now I have to mention the brand, because uh, uh, if you take an initiative like the Loom that Google is, is launching, with the balloon and, and, and how to cover uh, different regions that are not covered by internet. So I think our international community has to drive this innovation and there are innovations that are coming. So, um, but if we take it to political level, I think we have three things that we need to do as an international community. One mm -hmm. is what you are doing now, Chris, and, and, and emphasizing it, raising the voice mm -hmm. about equity and inclusion. It has to be, our concern all and leaving no one behind shouldn't be a rhetoric. It should be, it should drive our action. Second is this multi-actor, multi-stakeholder collaboration. It cannot be done by government alone or by a education institution or Tibet institution. Uh, there should be this multi-stakeholders and uh, obviously uh, the private sector, the telecom companies uh, are important. Third, I think if we are really serious, then it has to be, uh, uh, the right to internet. There is some countries, take Finland, for example, the right to internet is becoming uh, not just, uh, I would say, a luxury. It's a right because the right to education and right to skills development is also about the right uh, to access to connectivity. So it's about rights, and I think we need to drive also the right perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mohin. I couldn't agree more. We had uh, a couple of uh, our listeners raise this, and particularly one from Malaysia, where I know this is an issue our own uh, World Skills Malaysia has raised with us in our discussions about how we organise competitions in the future. I wonder if I can turn to a combination of the, the our champions and uh, Elfi as a, an employer. Uh, one of our questioners said, business and industry need to review their HR programmes and understand the differences between uh, well, their phrase is between millennials, Generation Xs, and boomers, different age groups in the workforce, as they each have different perspectives and look at things with different reactions to what they say. And I think we heard our champions say earlier, you know, the voice of youth needs to be heard in employers because they do actually bring a different set of values and a different set of expectations. Before I turn to Elfie, can, can I turn to any of our uh, young champions and say, do you agree with that? And how's your, what's your feeling about this? Any of you, raise a hand, Amelia, and then Shay. Yeah, I um, definitely agree with the sentiment of needing to um, 
it's about again inclusion and valuing all the different viewpoints and I know um within like business practice for myself um that's a way that we measure how well our business is not only seating in the present but will have longevity going forward is how it's meeting the needs of not just us as business owners but of all the stakeholders whether that is our employees our customers the community like that we're serving our community in a wider sense and so the best way to understand whether we are doing that is to actually engage and ask those stakeholders for their perspective so um, yeah I just would agree and and think that it should just be um, implemented into a business's um, systems um, okay. and it's the I guess I know just from my experience the easiest way to make sure that I continue to do the things I say that I'm going to do in the business is to systemize it so it shouldn't be a oh we'll just think about it sometimes you should be in the nature of doing it all the time okay and Shay? I couldn't agree more with Amelia. I think inclusion is very important and obviously every generation is going to have different perspectives. But I find that the youth in particular, we, there are no holds barred with young people. We tend to go straight for the hard hitting questions. We really are not bothered by how people will be perceiving us because if something needs to be said, if something needs to be asked, we will ask that question. So the youth tend to go with the flow of call to action. Like you are in a position to change it. So why, why is there so much debate around it? simply change it because at the end of the day what we have to say is valid okay thank you bath i'm going to come to you with a specific question about the hospitality industry in a minute so think about the future of the hospitality industry while i just turn to elfie on as an employer elfie your response as an employer well i think for me only one word counts and this is diversity diversity at all levels for me this is a tremendous successful factor and uh, I have been uh, around this business now in the Festo company since uh, quite some time. And uh, I see a lot of changes. I see a lot of changes in terms of diversity, uh, how we move forward on this topic. So this is for me a, a key success factor. And this applies, by the way, at all levels, not only uh, for Festo as a company. This is, applies also in the education sector and uh, um, where, at, the, at the manufacturing sector, wherever you go. So diversity is one thing. And the other thing is cooperation, collaboration, uh, to work together um, in, 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 the, in terms of uh, different organization, uh, national organizations, international organizations. So the SDG number 17, the wonderful uh, goal of partnership uh, is for me the second success factor. So diversity in SDG number 17. Yeah, strategic development goals are very yeah. important here. and we, we forget those at our peril. But can I take a question to you? Um, we've had one of our listeners raise the question about hospitality and skills in the hospitality industry. Um, and says, look, one of the most important aspects in hospitality uh, is that collaborative learning, that learning with and through others, actually plays an important part in developing the transversal skills that you need to be effective uh, in the customer relations, customer service. And I wondered what the question they're asking is, so what do you think the new norm would be in learning, in providing collaborative learning to help raise those interpersonal skills that are so essential in, in uh, hospitality? Well, in the learning process, for me, the, um, the new normal will, will be a normal that should have been here years ago. Um, and and it, it should be a normal to, to everybody, but it will come very natural now. It's the, uh, the normal of that these transferable skills. Uh, we have to let the, the people know that whatever they are learning here is suited and specific for the skills that they're doing now, but they will be able to find it um, in other jobs. Uh, the, this allows us to, to understand that what we learn does not um, keep us in, 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 in the school that we are in. For example, what I've learned into culinary school um, can take me into sales, 
uh, into uh, um, project management, into customer relation management, and so on and so on. Um, so it's important to to understand that it's not because you are learning a trade that you cannot do something else, and that also will bring a, a much bigger value to to the trade industry and to the trade learning process. Um, so I think it, it's something that we all realize now and, and has to be brought up on, on, on front, in front of the stage. Okay, thank you very much. Now we're drawing to a close. We've got uh, a few minutes though, and I wanted to really turn to all of you now to, uh, to sort of really think about what from your experience, both as the uh, recipients of learning, the providers of learning and the policy makers in learning, what from the champions first, what would be the most important single thing? If you were offered the opportunity to make one change in the education and training system that would bring benefit that has been learned through this COVID-19 crisis, what could it be? Uh, I'm going to go in reverse alphabetical order this time, so I'm going to go to Shay first. One change, Shay, you'd like to see in the education system, and we'll see how our experts respond to your suggestion. Um, it would be equal opportunity. Like Marine was saying, there's not accessibility is something that is not like forthright through the entire sector. What is available to me is not necessarily going to be available to other persons. So just for the provision to be made that everybody has the same equal opportunity to education as it is their right to have proper education available to them. Thank you. And Bart, one from you. Well, uh, I think we, we just talked about it. It's to, um, to be able to show to people that they can uh, be adaptable. Uh, for example, I would have, I think, gone sooner into hospitality industry if I knew that what I would learn would, would be able to lead me somewhere else. Uh, that's an issue that I had before to go in, into the hospitality. It's that I thought that when I step into it, I have to stay there when actually it's absolutely not the case. So um, it is important to, to be able to showcase that to the youth. It's not something you have to stay in if at the end you want to do something else, it's fine. And whatever you learn during your life will be able to help you anywhere else. So adaptability from you. Yes. Uh, and Amelia? I think I have the most important thing is inclusivity and equity, definitely. But I also have a challenge. And the challenge is, I think that skills in general always have a um, perception issue. That's a, a big problem in skills. And right now, in this moment, I think the world's appreciation for skills is bigger than ever, as they're seeing that they help us keep moving through this. So I would challenge the skills community to capitalize that on that um, change in perspective to encourage people who may not have before looked at skills pathways to, um, to really capitalize on that change in perception um, to get more people into skills because we, we know we're going to need them in the rebuild and the recovery. So yeah. Thank you. An unplanned plug for the essential workers and uh, this whole need to recognize that during this crisis, the people that have kept this world operating aren't necessarily the skills that parents think are the most important. We've really found what's essential now. So um, let me, I'm gonna to come to you in, uh, in, in a particular order, if I may. Um, so Mark, can I come to you first? Um, in terms of education, you've heard this call for diversity, adaptability, and a greater recognition of what are essential skills for world good. Your reactions? Yeah, I, I appreciate that so much. Um, my, my heart is with that. Somebody earlier said that we have a real big task ahead of us to change systems, um, what we currently do, um, because we just tend to default to the easy way. And I would encourage all of us not to default to the easy way, but default to the right way. And uh, Whatever, whatever that means, it uh, we we have to do it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Elfie. Yeah, I would uh, like to encourage us all uh, every day uh, not to waste this crisis, but uh, to turn it upside down and. Uh, 
let's recover, uh, as uh, they say at the United Nations, let's recover stronger, let's recover better, and let's recover smarter. And uh, try that every day uh, each of us uh, thinks about what can we contribute from, every, from our particular angle. Okay, thank you. And uh, Borheen, I mean, we heard three key words in the UNESCO cry, I think. We heard diversity, we heard adaptability, which, you know, transverse skills. Uh, and we also heard this real need to recognize the importance of VET. Uh, is UNESCO able to drive this? Can you make a difference here? Can your global education coalition really help us take advantage of this uh, in the post-COVID world? Indeed, that's what we are working uh, day and, and night for that. And, and obviously, uh, it's, uh, it's, I think, a task that is not for UNESCO. It's a task for uh, the, the global community. It's a task for our youth uh, who uh, are uh, also um, contributing to this debate, but also the world skills teachers, as, as Mark was, was mentioning. I, I would like to, uh, to say, I mean, I know we are in the, in the last um, moment of our webinar, which uh, was really uh, incredibly uh, rich and, and very uh, important for our discussion today. Uh, you were mentioning uh, the importance of health and uh, we were mentioning the importance of uh, the transversal skills and skills that are uh, the 21st century. I think all of us also during the last two weeks were hit by uh, what I will say, I can't breathe. I think it's very important that we take the global citizenship and the citizenship dimension. And I think Bart was, was saying how he engaged voluntarily in, in some of the initiative. So it's important that we don't think uh, about uh, technical and vocational and education and training as just the hand. It's the hand, it's the heart, it's the, it's the head, it's everything. That blend of skills, that set of skills is required. Transversal skills, citizenship, engaging. We, want, we don't want robot. The robot will be there. We want humanity because that's what will differentiate us from, from robot. I think that's what we need to take as a reimagining uh, TVET going forward. It's a TVET that is inclusive, it's a TVET, but this TVET that is a human, that is uh, catering for uh, the people, that is valorizing people. And one point that is important it's not only sufficient to learn skills. What is important is to valorize that skills, both in further learning, in the labor market, in society. And that's why we need to work together in this direction. How we, we build back, but how we build better. Because if we build back what was there, I think we will miss the point. And UNESCO together with all the partners of the Global Education Coalition uh, will be actively engaging in word skills is a critical partner there. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you very much, Bohim. Well, thank you all. Thank you, our uh, audience, and all the many questions. I haven't been able to answer all of them by any means. Um, but thank you for participating, and thank you especially to Amelia, Shay, and Bart, to Elfie, Bohim, and Mark for your contributions. I wish everyone uh, good luck for the coming weeks and hope that everything will return to normal again soon. Uh, hopefully, sorry, the new normal. And that new normal has to be more diverse, more inclusive, uh, and more adaptable. And on top of that, it needs to recognize that it's the essential skills that have kept the world moving that are the ones we cannot afford to lose. Um, before I go, I'd like to mention that we have a number of uh, additional World Skills Conference talks coming up. Uh, on the 1st of July, uh, can skills competition training and assessments be effective online? Some of the issues we talked about today. A week after that, on the 8th of July, we'll be examining a very important and live issue. Again, a critical one. How do we ensure diversity and inclusion in skills competitions and vocational education and training? Uh, on World Youth Skills Day, on 15th of July, we're going to have a dedicated champions panel on skills and a word you heard mentioned earlier resilience. And then finally, on the 22nd of July, I'll be returning to discuss the collection of assets and uh, materials that are going to form part of the World Skills Museum in opening in Shanghai in September 2021. We'd be delighted to see all of you again. Uh, you can find all of the details and registration links on the simple website, worldskillsconference.com. 
Uh, and so once again, let me say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to all of you, and so have a very successful day. Good night.